I'm happy to be with all of you today. My thanks to the elders for, again, extending the opportunity for me to speak to you. I have been a little under the weather in different ways over uh, the last several days, so I'll try to do my best to push through this today, and I ask you bear with me. I'm thankful for the prayers you had for uh, my stroke. It was fortunately a minor stroke, and I recovered uh, quicker than it came on. I, it was quite uh, quite encouraging that way. So we're struggling with a few other things here, but uh, all of it's uh, something we can bear with and move on. There are lots of ways to go about a sermon, but I frequently mimic the most common approach Jesus took, which is to tell a story and learn lessons from it. My story today is personal. It has three parts. As some of you may know, I grew up in Montana. My parents and my five older siblings were born on the eastern side of Montana, which is a part of the Great Plains. I'd say you could characterize it as flat, dusty, and dry. Or when you're a kid visiting relatives for your vacation, boring. My family moved to the western side before I was born. So I grew up in Rocky Mountains, where there were rivers, creeks, ponds, and lakes everywhere. My parents, neither one knew how to swim really. So it was important to them that my younger brother and I learn since we'd naturally be around water. And that meant our summers were spent in swimming lessons and open swim all afternoon, virtually every day of the summer at the city pool. I got pretty good at swimming. And I always wondered if I could do what it took to be certified as a lifeguard. Fast forward to college, where I found one opening in my class schedule my last quarter of my senior year at Lipscomb University. I decided that even though I didn't see how I'd use any lifeguard certification, I wanted to see if I could get it in. Three of us were in the class. My roommate, who was a lifeguard at Disney, but needed, rec needed to be recertified, myself and the shot putter on the track team. You know the type, not overly tall, but big and very muscular. The saying goes that fat floats, but muscle sinks. And in trying to rescue him during class, I can attest to that saying by being true. I learned a lot in the class about CPR, about water rescue, and about when you have to decide to abandon a rescue out of fear, it could become a double drowning. Let's fast forward one more time. To the end of my eldest, Lindsay, second grade school year. Her teacher decided to have a pool party for her class and invited all of them to her house as well as the parents. She also knew our middle child, Bryce, so invited him there as well. Now, I personally knew Lindsay's class fairly well. I taught them junior achievement during the year. So we got to the teacher's house and the teacher took the parents in to see where the bathrooms were and the kitchen. But instead of joining them, we settled in on the patio, some distance away from the pool, and Bryce went over to swim. Lindsay didn't want to go as none of the girls in her class were there yet. So her and I went about naming who was there. I finished and Lindsay said, Nihar is here. I told her I, I thought I'd seen Mirai, but couldn't see him. I said, is that him on the diving board? But she said, no, that was just a sibling of another boy in her class. She then said, Bryce just swam over Nihar. Boy, can he hold his breath for a long time. Everything became surreal at that point as he jumped up and ran to the pool. Nihar was curled up on the bottom, so I sent the teacher's 16-year-old daughter to pull him up to the edge to me. He wasn't breathing, and his Indian skin color was more of a mix of yellow and green. I set about executing CPR and set the screaming 16-year-old in to get her mother and the others. The teacher rushed out and helped me execute CPR. This was when the recommended process still called for two people. We got him back to breathing, though it was rough, but couldn't return him to consciousness. Parents flagged down a former EMT who happened to wander by and he joined us. And after a while, a fire truck and ambulance both arrived, so the EMTs took over. But Niyar didn't respond to the teacher's voice nor mine. And the only reaction that happened was when they gave him a shot and he grunted. They rushed him to the hospital. The remaining children were crying, <clears throat> but mainly because the party was over, not because they understood the situation with their classmate. One boy had come up while we were doing CPR and said, well, he said he couldn't swim. I called the hospital early that evening to check on his progress. I was told that he had checked out. Considering how I'd last seen him, I couldn't picture him being dismissed. 
So I was immediately concerned by what that could be. But the person working the desk wasn't allowed to give me any more information. We didn't know the outcome until school started in the fall. He was listed as being in Lindsay's class again. That wasn't confirmation in itself. It could have just been left over from the previous year. And his absence the first day of school wasn't comforting until it was explained that he had developed pneumonia while he was in Texas. So he was in the hospital there. I had no expectation that I would someday need that lifeguard training. But today, Nihar is, as far as I can tell, a normal young adult. There's a lot of lessons I think we can gain from this, but I want us to concentrate on just three main points today as we relate life saving and soul saving. First, I'd like to start out with the fact that you have to be prepared. You have to be ready for such situations and opportunities. One has to be ready to see the opportunity. If I had gone in the house with the other parents, if I had not wanted to keep my own price in the pool, or if I had not heeded or taken seriously Lindsay's words, then the opportunity to save me are would have been lost. No one expects such opportunities. We see them on TV, but even when they're true stories, there's something that happens to other people, not to us. When it comes to saving souls, we have to be vigilant for whenever an opportunity may open up to us. Opportunities for us to reach the lost come in so many different ways that we need to be ready for each of them, even in these difficult times. Sometimes the opportunity is just the blatant ability to teach someone the word, which may come when we're expecting it or when we're not expecting it. As was read early in 2 Corinthians, or 2 Timothy, rather, 4 verses 1 through 2, Paul tells us, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in the season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Be ready in season and out of season, whenever it may be. The opportunity to preach and teach someone is the most obvious kind of opportunity, even if it may also be the most intimidating. It is likely the opportunity with the highest potential of short-term success or at least closure. We do need to understand our role in soul saving is to plant and water. We don't need to dwell on whether the increase is realized. That's God's part. As Paul reminded the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. But sometimes opportunities are a matter of doing good works, or more subtly, by just living a life that is made up of good works and absent of bad characteristics. Paul told the young preacher Titus in Titus chapter 3 verses 1 and 2, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men, ready for every good work. Sometimes the opportunity comes through more through others challenging your faith and your beliefs. You are given a chance to teach by defending why you believe in Jesus and have hope in eternity. This is what Peter shared in 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready, ready for good works, ready to give defense, ready for the opportunities to come forward, forward for you, to jump on them, whatever they may be. No matter how the opportunity presents itself or what the specifics are which define the appropriate response, we are commanded to reach out to the loss and thus have to be prepared to execute Jesus' great commission of Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. 
The second thing we need to understand is that we need to recognize those who are in trouble. I had to take Lindsay's youthful statement and understand Nihar wasn't just holding his breath, but was actually drowning. For better or worse, it's not that hard for us. As Paul told the Romans in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone needs soul saving. It's not hard to find someone whose soul is in danger. That's the vast majority of the people you come in contact with. As Matthew recorded in Jesus' words, Matthew 7, 13, and 14, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go by in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. But like the situation with Nihar, we just cannot seem to comprehend that those we talk with, work with, live near, and love are in danger of losing their souls. We know that intellectually, but we cannot seem to apply that in practical situations. We want to believe that maybe God will take into account a good life. Oh, there, there's always tomorrow or there's someone else who can work to rescue them. God puts us in situations where he wants us to take action, to execute what we know to be the right steps. We also need to understand that it is not within our ability to determine who is willing to accept the help and who is not. It is not our responsibility to make that determination. We don't get discriminatory about the people who we can reach out to. Instead, it is our responsibility to help God sow the seed. As Jesus explained in the parable of the sower that we find in Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It is not up to us to determine the receptiveness of the soil, nor to harvest any crop. God wants a seed sown everywhere. The sower put it everywhere with the chance that somebody in that condition would react to it, not just put it in what we thought to be the most fertile ground. It is up to us to, uh, up to, us to sow or to water the seed and leave the rest up to the listeners and, most importantly, up to God. We need to understand the need. And finally, you need to act, even if you question your ability to do so. One of the things I wondered as I took that lifeguard course was whether I'd remember what I'd learned when I needed to do it. And when the opportunity arose, I worried about whether I was doing things right. I foolishly wondered if I was doing more harm than good, as if doing nothing when the boy clearly was not breathing was better than making a mistake. I understand it's a common reaction to question your training and your fitness to take action. It could have been understood that I had taken my lifeguard training 23 years earlier, so I did not know, the, still, still, still know the right things to do. But while worrying about or questioning one's ability to act may be natural, it is not an acceptable reason not to act. Don't get me wrong. Lots of important people have questioned such, even heroes of the Bible. Exodus 3, 9 through 11. Now, therefore... Behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Egypt, Israel out of Egypt? Now we know in retrospect that Matt Moses was an outstanding leader who ultimately proved that God knows what he is doing. 
Yet Moses doubted, and God had to refute his reasoning. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10, for I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul knew he was an apostle. But in even seeing himself in that very critical role, a very special role, he saw himself as the least and only what he was by the grace of God. He also told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. The chief of sinners still acted, and God's kingdom has been unquestionably greatly blessed because of it. Some Bible heroes had so much faith in God that even when others might question their ability to act, they stood firm. Perhaps no one in no situation better exemplified this than David in 1 Samuel 17, verses 311, and then later verses 32 through 37. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you should be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all the Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Then starting in verse 32, then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this, this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. David believed in himself, but more importantly, he believed that God would carry him through. Not only had that self-confidence, but he was able to convince Saul that he was capable of doing, it, no matter of his stature, no matter of his youth. Whether you have the confidence of David or you question your ability like Moses. The bottom line is that you must respond to opportunities to plant the seed or to water it in order that God can give the increase. So what did I learn from this set of stories in my life? I learned I needed to be prepared to help others, even to the point of saving a life. I learned that I need to be open to recognize those who are in trouble, even when they or others don't understand they are in trouble. And I learned that you have to act, even if you question your abilities, to act in order to help someone or to save their life. What we all need to understand is that God expects us to be prepared for opportunities to assist in saving the souls. That requires us to know what God has said and requires of us to live an exemplary life of hope 
that teaches God's message without a sermon. We need to understand that virtually everyone we come into contact is in need of rescue, whether they or others comprehend that reality or not. And finally, it is imperative that we act on opportunities to reach lost souls, whether we feel we are prepared or capable or not. God will help us just as he did David. And we can enlist the aid of our fellow Christians as well. We just have to act. And even in these difficult times, we will find opportunities if we're looking for them. Today, you may find yourself like Nehar, drowning in sin and the risk of losing your soul. You have the opportunity to be saved by understanding what you've heard in God's word, making a public confession that Jesus Christ is your Lord, repenting or turning away from your life of sin, and being immersed in baptism for the remission of your sins. Lindsay has a t-shirt that says, my lifeguard can walk on water. Let that be the case for you. If you've acted already to become a Christian, but again, find yourself drowning in sin and at risk of losing your soul, then God stands ready to pull you out of that sin, just as Jesus pulled a doubting Peter up from the sea when he faltered, walking on the water. Additionally, your church family stands ready and willing and desirous to lift you up as well as well to forgive you as necessary. Considering action you might need to discuss with the elders and the opportunities allows as we sing this song.